Hi everyone, my name is Jackie and I'm a biochemistry major at Sacramento State University and welcome back to my channel. For today's video, I'm actually going to be interviewing a professor at Sacramento State. Her name is Dr. Samari Quinones and she has her PhD in microbiology. So in the interview, she's going to talk about her background and a little bit about her journey of how she got to where she's at now. And she's also going to talk about um, different barriers she's overcome and some other questions that you guys actually had for her. I also want to mention real quick that if you like this art that you see here, Dr. Quinones actually draws this herself and you can go follow her on her Instagram and you can actually purchase these pictures. So go check that out. So let's get to it. Can you introduce yourself and tell us about your background and your journey to how you got to where you're at? Sure. Um, my name is Samari Quinones. I am originally from Puerto Rico. I was born in a town called Umacao, which is on the east side of the island. Um, from there, I grew up with, um, with my parents. They were both um, biologists to start with. So I got immersed into biology very early on in my life. I had textbooks and things like that in my house, which I used to sneak out in the middle of the night to grab a biology textbook and read it in my room. And that's how I started getting my knowledge. Um, after that, I was invested in biodiversity with my dad because he used to take me like snorkeling in the beach. And we would look at the different biodiversity and fishes and animals that he would show me. And then from my mom's side, she's a microbiologist. So her job was to be the lab tech at the University of Puerto Rico in Umacao. And she prepared the materials for the microbiology labs for the undergrads. And she allowed me, like allowed me to help her out. So from a young age, I was working in the lab with her. That kind of propelled me into majoring in biology but I really didn't know exactly what I wanted. I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grew up at all, but I knew that it had to be somewhere in science. Um, so I started exploring different areas. I did different research projects as an undergrad until I started kind of like eliminating the things that I hated and that propelled me into a path that led me to now. So then after I gained my bachelor's degree in microbiology, I went to the University of Davis to earn my PhD, also in microbiology. I still didn't know what I wanted, like us in a field, and I didn't know what career I wanted after that. I always said that I would never ever be a professor, so because I didn't want to teach. So I really wanted to be a scientist at an industry or a company where I could just go in, do the job, and then come home and no extra homework. But um, at the end of my PhD, when I was starting to look for biotech jobs, that didn't really happen. It was also kind of like in the years of the recession, so there weren't a lot of money. So I, I ended up in a postdoc, but I still needed to find a career and I needed to get my bills paid. So I applied to be a part-time lecturer at Sacramento State, and I got my first genetics lab. And at the end of that very first semester, I just fell in love with teaching. And here I am now, six years afterwards, and I'm still teaching. How have you felt being a woman in STEM throughout your education? It's funny because throughout my education, I didn't feel that I was a woman in STEM. Growing up in Puerto Rico, I always had very strong female models, ro role models, and most of my professors were females. And because we're all Puerto Ricans, we all had like the same style, the same attitudes. So we were all, or they were all strong women teaching us how to move forward. I did have male professors, but I never saw that the gender disparity in Puerto Rico. Once I moved to the United States and I started my PhD in UC Davis, I was lucky enough to join a lab that treated us all as equals. My mentor was fantastic and he treated everybody the same way. So I never felt that I was being biased because I was a woman or even because I was a Latina and like nothing ever happened. Once I started moving up in the ranks as in when I joined my first postdoc, 
that's when things started getting a little dicey. And that's when I joined a lab where I was the only female. And I did feel uh, a little, like my voice wasn't being heard. And every time that I said something, I was ignored or just being bypassed until like I had a lab mate who used to repeat what I said and then that was acknowledged. And he would say, well, that's what she just said. So that's when they started to listen to what I was saying. And then in school, not much of the colleagues, but the treatment that I used to get from the students was different. And I could tell that it was because I'm short in stature, I'm a female and I looked young when I started. So I did get a few male students yelling at me for their grades. The only thing is that they didn't know they were yelling to a Puerto Rican. So I yelled back. (laughs) Uh, Can you talk more about your experience in research labs? Yes, research labs, I've been working since I was an undergraduate student. So I've had multiple lab experiences, I think at least 10, because uh, I did four as an undergraduate, then I did five rotations, then I have my PhD and my postdoc. So I've been in around 10 research labs and they are all very different. They all have their own culture. The mentors make a big difference as to the dynamics of the lab that is going to be. Your lab mates are also different depending on where you are. And so that's like the personal part of the research lab. Then you have the experimental part, which is very hard. And experiments do not work the first, third, maybe the 10th time. So you have to be resilient and you have to keep on trying until that one day something happens and and everything works. As a graduate student, I can say that it was pretty isolating working in the lab because you're concentrated on your own project. Sometimes you go on days without talking to anybody else. You just go into the lab work and then you go back home. It's difficult, but once you have that result that you were looking after, life becomes so, so satisfying. What are some barriers you have overcome? I would say that the biggest barrier that I've had is the language barrier, and I still have trouble with, with it. Um, I was raised mainly speaking Spanish, but I've always known English since I was a little girl. But knowing English in science is a completely different monster altogether. So when I started my graduate courses as a first year PhD candidate, that was hard. It was like going into the classroom and not knowing anything that the professor was saying. So I remember having this one class at 7.30 in the morning and just going out of it without learning a single thing. And I would just be like taking notes on my notebook blindly of the things that were said, like wrongly spelled because I didn't know what they were. And then I would go home, look at my textbook on the internet and try to put the pieces together until I have the message. And then I would look it up in Spanish And then I was like, oh, that's what that means. So I had to teach myself science in English. So then I would learn the material. So then I would go to my exams. Now I'm at the point where I can no longer speak science in Spanish because I have relearned everything in English. And sometimes, and I tell my students this all the time, that I forget a word in both languages. So I have two languages in my head that are fighting for each other and sometimes I just grow blanks. So that is my biggest barrier. What type of diversity do you see in your classrooms? It's interesting because every beginning of the semester, I count how many females versus how many males I have in the classroom. And it's overwhelmingly females that I have in my classes. However, when you move up in the ranks and you start seeing like higher leadership positions, those women are not there. So it is very interesting to see that we are preparing you, you you women, you females, and then we don't see them anymore. We keep seeing the males that are the ones that are moving up. Can you talk about uh, what classes you teach? Currently, I am teaching general genetics. I've been teaching that lecture class for about 
uh, 12 semesters now, including the lab portion of it. Then I have also taught general biology for non-majors, and I've taught some genetic courses for graduate students, and I do the senior research component class for our um, researchers on campus. What programs are you involved in to help the minority representation in STEM classes? I have been involved in programs aimed to increase diversity since I was an undergrad. So as an undergrad in the University of Puerto Rico in Macau, I participated in the MARC program and in the LSAMP programs as a student. And those were the programs that prepared me to go into the PhD. Now as a faculty, I work in those programs as program coordinator. So now I, coordin I help coordinate the LSAM program at Sacramento State. I help coordinate the RISE program. And I'm also the faculty um, advisor and founder of the SACNAS student chapter at Sacramento State. And on top of that, I, I volunteer with the SACNAS society because I am one of their STEM leaders. Now we're going to move on to the questions that have been submitted by other people. What was the biggest obstacle you, you faced during your journey and how did you overcome it? I've had a lot of obstacles. Um, the first one is the language one. I thought that one was going to hurt me a lot, but I overcame it by, like I said, taking the notes, going home, translating them, and then relearning them again in English until I got to a point where I no longer needed to do that and I could continue learning in English. I've had difficulties in, in moving up in my position at work. I can't really do anything about that. So I have been doing my best to gain leadership positions inside my lectureship appointment. So that's why I can teach as a lecturer, but I can also help run programs like LSAMP and SACNAS and RICE. So I have worked really, really hard to earn the respect of my colleagues. So then they would um, help me succeed within my own appointment, basically. Did you ever have serious doubt in yourself in terms of being accepted in your field, in your PhD program, and afterwards beginning your career? Every single day. <laughs> Every day uh, I've had self-doubt ever since I moved to the United States. In Puerto Rico, I, I was very, very confident in my abilities. I knew that I was going to make it. And when I made it to the US, I felt so dumb, out of place, like I didn't belong, they made a mistake, all those things, I felt them. And being seen as an other, being seen as an outcast, I felt that every day. I remember one day specifically where when I was in my first semester as a PhD mm, candidate and um, I remember being in lab meeting and I did not understand a single word that they were saying. And so I was kind of holding my tears back because I didn't want anybody to see me cry. But then as soon as the lab meeting was over, I left the room and I went straight into the graduate program coordinator's office and I just started crying. And I said, I can't do this. I'm stupid. I don't understand. I want to leave. And what they did is they gave me the paper to quit. So I took the paper, I went home, and then I just sat there looking at that paper and I decided that I was not going to fill it out that night because I may have been overreacting and I just left it on top of my table and I didn't do anything with it. And every day I will look at that piece of paper and I say, you know what, just give it one more day, just give it one more day until I don't know what happened to that piece of paper anymore. And I finished and now that I'm in my job, I still feel like I don't belong, but I try very hard to work through it. Do you have any advice for others who may be feeling the same way? Yes. What I was feeling is called the imposter syndrome. And that is very, very real. We do feel it. As soon as you feel that you don't belong, you start like reasoning why you don't belong and you start believing those reasons. Sometimes what happens is that we think that what others see in us we are not measuring up to their expectations of us. 
So we are self-imposing some expectations that are not real. I try to get rid of those expectations that I know that are not real because when people look at me, they don't see what I think they see, but I strongly feel that way. So I try to maybe push those down, build confidence, show that I think I know what I'm saying. And I do go with the words, fake it till you make it every single day. How did you balance mental health and academics? I have always been an avid TV watcher. And so I do take mental breaks by just not thinking about anything and watching TV. Lately, what I have been doing is I've been drawing a lot to not think about work. When I started working at Sacramento State as a lecturer, I wanted to move up. And so I was working really, really hard. And it would be that I would work in like on campus and I would come home and I would continue working until I went to bed. It got to a point where I was, I was getting depressed and I was not being um, productive anymore, even though I was working a lot. So I decided that I was going to work on campus and sometimes I do work from home, but I do set a schedule. So after five o'clock, I do not work anymore. And I do other things that are not work related. I even tell my students that I do not answer emails after 6 p.m. Because it is my time to be at home. So I let know that, that my time at home is, is important to me. So I have made boundaries to keep that work-life balance. Oh, then during like your bachelor's and your PhD, during that time, how, was, how were you able to balance your mental, mental health and your studies uh, during that time? I don't, I don't know how I was able to balance. I, I do tell myself that I am a strong person because when I feel like I am starting to go down the spiral, I try to take myself out as quickly as possible. So I do change my routine when I notice that I am going down. That's not to say that I have some high days and some low days because they do happen. And sometimes I feel low and I don't, can't explain why. Sometimes I feel very productive and very high. So I do a lot of work on those days. So if I have a low day, then I say, you know what? Yesterday I worked hard. So today I, I earned this low day. So I try to um, logically explain to myself that it's okay to not be productive one day and then the next day I can go back to it. So that is all the questions. Is there anything else you would like to say or add? Yes. Lately, we have been doing a lot of work and there's a lot of efforts to increase diversity in the STEM field. Specifically, we are pushing forward individuals for marginalized communities. My Specific passion is to move forward women of color because that is who I am and I personally identify with that. So I am working really hard and being a, a person that helps push forward other women of color into sciences. But once you are there, it is hard. It is very hard to persist. It is very hard to find a person that you can identify with and hold on to so you can move together so you have to persist if that's what you really want then you have to work through it if you change your mind and you don't want to be there anymore that is totally fine too we only have one life and we should be happy living it so i that's something that i have always done to myself am i happy doing this if the answer is no you can bet that I'm moving away from it because I want to be happy in every aspect of my life. And I tell that to my students as well. So no matter where you are, just see if that is the best place for you. Well, thank you, Jackie. Um, it was a pleasure being here and, and answering your questions. Good luck with your YouTube channel. And I hope that you help us move women in STEM forward. So that is all for today's video. I want to say thank you again to Dr. Quinones for doing this interview. I really appreciate it and I hope this helped you all out. Don't forget to hit the subscribe button and give this video a thumbs up if it was helpful for you. All right, until next time, bye.